ready? Yes. Okay. Welcome everyone to Senate uh, media availability and in this time we also answer questions of citizens who have a question or are watching us and we welcome all those who are joining us over the internet. We really enjoy this time and we enjoy answering your questions. It's a good part of the process. We have two leftover questions from yesterday, so we'll go right to those questions. And All right, so the first question is, the balanced budget amendment only covers one topic of federal overreach. How does the Utah Senate plan on addressing the many areas of federal usurpation, uh, specifically within the policy making of the unelected bureaucrats? Great question, and there are many ways that the federal government is overreaching, and I don't know of any proposal that addresses every single overreach. We are, we did pass the balanced budget amendment, which would address uh, fiscal restraints upon the federal government. I know that there are other ideas out there, like the C uh, COS stands for Convention of the States, uh, they have three items. It's not all the items where there are federal overreach. Uh, one of the items in there, and the trouble with having a one resolution with many different ideas is you're going to lose support somewhere. And so um, while we do favor the parts of the COS with physical constraint and also um, uh, being able to push back on rules and regulations that are in that uh, resolution. Uh, we have not been in favor of term limits, and we've talked about that here in this, uh, in this media availability in time past, and I invite you to look back on some of that discussion, and you can get those answers. But <clears throat> right now, we don't have a proposal that actually addresses all of them, nor do I think you could find a proposal that would address all of them, and it's best to do it individually so you don't lose uh, support for the whole, um, the whole effort. And that's at the, the, least the recommendation I would make to anyone that's wanting to the legislature to pursue a constitutional convention type of proposal. What's the other question? The second question is, will we get permitless concealed carry through the Senate this year, or will the Senate do the governor's bidding again and keep it off, off of his desk? I don't know if we even have a bill. Anybody know we have a bill? I don't know of a bill uh, this year that's out there for constitutional carry everywhere, but uh, there may be one starting in the House that we, or, or the Senate for that matter, that we haven't seen. Uh, we're still pretty early in the session, uh, so there could still be some bi bills filed that we haven't seen, or there can even be some bills open uh, if the floor agrees to do that. But I just don't know of anything out there this year. And I just might remind the viewer, it's a great question, but we did place that bill on the governor's desk several years ago, and he vetoed it. So uh, just, I think that needs to be an understanding. We'll go to questions from the media. Um, President, were you really not expecting that amendment uh, or that substitution on your toll road bill? I mean, that's changed it pretty significantly. Why did it turn up the way it did as opposed to going through the regular process? I didn't expect it, and I've expected it over the last 24, 48 hours, but I did not expect it or was thinking about it when we went to committee. Why not talk about it yesterday then um, when you discussed the bill on the floor? You talked about all the misconceptions. Clearly, that wasn't a misconception with the way the bill turned out. It was intended to go there. There the was, we were working on the potential for a substitute and just haven't, hadn't concluded on that effort completely yet. And so, I mean, it's, there was an effort forth, and Senator Fuller may be able to answer some questions regarding that. We've asked him to come in and be involved. Why, why not, though, look at it that way from the beginning, if indeed you were looking at it as a way to raise more money for the state? Why not look at it as uh, all roads, uh, including current capacity? 
roads. I think that's why we're raising the question. But I mean, why, I, I'm asking you as, as the originator of the bill, why wasn't, if indeed it was to look at, you know, opening up possibilities for more revenue sources? It just wasn't, I was, I was focused on uh, the efforts that needed to be taken if there was going to be the possibility of doing this for Little Conwood Canyon. Again, we don't want to give the misconception that this is driven by no, just Little Conwood Canyon, but in when we build the additional lane up there, which UDOT is working on, it's in the NEPA process, this is something that needed to be available to them. That's what I was focused on. And uh, to Senator Fillmore's credit, which I appreciate, he came and brought this, actually brought this to me, uh, I don't know, three or four days ago, actually. Yeah. And then uh, we were just working on uh, the effort to bring it to the floor, so. So, so uh, uh, this has been an issue for a long time, as I mentioned on the floor, that uh, uh, if you're going to have fairness, you shouldn't just, as it just was articulated very well by the president, too, it shouldn't be the new people that are paying for their road and paying for everybody else's road, too. And that, that becomes a real problematic situation. And, a lot of the debate on the floor and the debate that we, at least I've heard on it, acted as if we could total existing capacity. And I think people assumed we could because everybody's talking about it and wondering how we're going to add even uh, additional hot lanes or, and, and, and whether they're new existing capacity. And Senator Fillmore actually came to me and we talked about it. And it's something that I think ought to be done. So that's part of the refining process as you see a bill start is I don't think it, uh, talking to the president that he even thought of it until it started to come up in, and he can speak for himself, but I, I know when we approached him on it or Senator Fillmore did, it was kind of a new idea, but it's something that, that I think when you think about makes sense. But sorry to harp on this because it's but, but let me just question. also just, just clarify, I think we could have run it on second yesterday, but I, one of the reasons why we felt like that today was the right day to do it on third was, that's why we have a second and third reading calendar in the Senate, is we wanted to focus on the electronic aspects of this of the bill and not get that part overclouded by bringing uh, also uh, the, the argument of all capacity. So as you can see, we had a great discussion on that first part yesterday and today we have a had a great discussion on just the uh, the idea of now do open it up to all roads sure. and I'll maybe let Senator Fillmore go ahead and sure. express his yeah. reasons and why he felt like this was sure. the right thing to do from my standpoint on the timing this is something that came up in my three legislative town halls um, people in my district are concerned that that's where that's where all the growth is happening on the west side of Salt Lake County that if we only toll new roads, then we're going to have to pay for our roads through tolls and for everybody else's roads through the gas tax. It's just going to be just by accident of geography that we're going to have to pay twice for our roads. And um, I hadn't read the President's bill at that point, although I knew it was out there. So the <laughs> it's interesting. He was scheduled in the Transportation Committee meeting to present a bill just before I was, and his bill took a long time. <laughs> right, and you substituted it in that committee meeting, and so it was when when I was there, I just got to hear the last half of your presentation on the bill because I mentioned which, that. Yes, which started me thinking about well, what can we do to address this now within the bill that we've got? Yeah. And so anyway, at that point, then I reached out to drafting attorneys, Senator Adams, President of your House. It take a, took a few days for all of that to come together, and that's why, from a timing and process standpoint, how it ended up the way it did. The refining process. I mean, it's just that less than 24 hours ago yesterday, at about 2.30 on the, in the second floor of a uh, session of the Senate, you, you said, you, I think it's unfortunate that it, it doesn't, that current law doesn't allow for tolling existing roads. You didn't say, I'm going to try to amend this. <laughs> you just said, I think it's unfortunate. And then today it came up. So it's just, and that's why at least two senators voted against this today because of the process. So it just, it seems like we've, 
there was some misinformation. You said it was misconception that it would uh, toll, lead to tolling on existing roads, but it sounds like the plan was to open it up, at least before yesterday's uh, floor session, the plan was to open it up to existing tolling. I'm sorry, tolling existing. I'd say my plan was certainly to introduce the idea to see if we could get support of the body. Okay. And I think we had good debate on it today, right? Right. I mean, all, all sides yeah. were represented there. The, I feel pretty good about the process and how that played out. Yeah, I would argue that I would argue that it's good process because we were able to focus on the electronic again once again. We were able to focus on the original intent of the bill and then now focus on an additional aspect of of public policy regarding tolling. And is it good policy? I just have to say absolutely yes. It's just very poor policy, as Senator Fillmore talked about, to allow one segment of the population, whether it be Utah County or West Salt Lake County or East Salt Lake County or Davis County or Box Elder County or Weaver County, to, to put the burden of the toll road when the rest of the state doesn't have them. I think, I think Utah now has the challenge of trying to figure out if they use this tool, and they may, may never do, the bill was passed. I, somebody will have to help me, whether it's 2005, 6, or 7, the original tolling bill. But they haven't used it since then, and they've had the authorization since then. So nobody knows if they're going to use it. So they've got to go through the process, but they've got to have a tool. And we've given them a, a broader tool, and whether it fits and whether it gets public acceptance, I don't know. But I think it's good policy, and I think it was, and it was either Senator Adams or Senator Howard Stevenson that made the point, and, but maybe it was you, Senator Finlay. I can't remember, but I think it was either you or Senator Stevenson that made the point. Is part of the reason why we haven't addressed that it's not been used is because it's discriminant. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. not a, it's not a good tool right now. And so it, the the pot, the the ability and the barrier for UDOT to even consider it is so high because it's only on new capacity and it's, you know... It, it's, Which communities do we want to... Yeah, right. And it, it, it's just not fair. Or with approval from the legislature. It, it can be on existing with approval from you, you guys and the commission, right? Mm -hmm. But not after that amendment. But what you do then is if... That's not great either because uh, what you do then is every all the... All the legislators who <laughs> represent the haves uh, then are going to be potentially voting against the legislators who are the have-nots, so to speak, uh, those that don't have the capacity yet and, and are in the growth areas. And so it's better to take it out of that political realm and put it in the hands of UDOT, who is going to do this not based on pure politics like we do deal with up here. So you don't want to see the legislature play a role in the future in who is and isn't told? You want to leave that up to who got for we a always, political? We always have that authority to change the law. I mean, Senator Adams, chair of the Transportation Commission, we kind of took the, the listing of roads, although we still do it a little bit, uh, but we, for the most part, leave that up to the Transportation Commission. We've already gone down this road in trying to depoliticize what we do with roads by giving it to a more administrative body, Senator Adams. Yeah, the department needs to do their work, and they need to know the tools available. And we're we're going to spend resources working on this that are basically wasted resources. And they, they aren't going to act uh, in that opposition to the legislature. They've received their funding from us, and you know, I mean, there's a there's a connection there, like every other state agency. So, so there is oversight. And we're not they're not going to take car flight authority. You can talk to the, the department, uh, well, the, the the directors and the the department director and others. But uh, they've acted very responsibly in the past. And as I said on the floor, I mean, we've got roads that. Uh, taken forever to get through a process, and if anybody thinks this is not going to be an open and fair process, and uh, you'll have legislators weigh in on it, and, and we'll, if they get out of line, we'll bring it back and, and try to deal with it. But ten years to go through a process for the West Davis, 
I mean, uh, I think President Trump said it really well. How long did it take to build the Empire State Building? Uh, 12 months. And it takes us 12 years to do the, to do the study for a road now. I mean, we have, it just is a very, very cumbersome process. If everybody's worried about having it be an open process, they need to not worry because it's going to be way open and it's going to be very transparent. And there'll be a lot more discussion on this. And uh, it's, yeah, I'm confident that it's, before any toll road gets enacted, that there'll be a ton more discussion. Switching gears, I guess, um, House Bill 205 passed the House yesterday. Um, we had the conversation yesterday. By about, name, please. I'm sorry, the... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. The <laughs> Down Syndrome Non-Discrimination Act. Oh, okay. Is that right? Um, and, and yesterday we had a conversation in here about constitutional issues with some of those ballot initiatives. Is the constitutional issue that the legislative attorneys found with that bill, do you think that's going to prevent it from moving forward in the Senate? Uh, well, we really haven't had many discussions on it. I, I understand that there may be, a, is there a constitutional note on the bill? There is. Okay. Well, we have to, every day, determine policy based on uh, the political will of the people. We're the, we're the uh, people's representatives. And, you know, everybody up here represents a constituency. And we're going to vote our conscience on, on, on those things. And, you know, we have to consider the constitutionality of everything. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to make a, a vote based on our representation and what we feel is right. With that, with that is, is probably the one thing we need to look at. There's a fiscal note as well. We have to protect that if it passes. And, it's, and we've got that constitutional load on it, we need to address that issue of what it's going to cost us to defend it as well. Is that something the state should be spending its money on, defending a bill like that? We've never won one on it yet. This, uh, if it were to pass, it wouldn't be the, the first time that an unconstitutional bill was approved by the state legislature. So would it be prudent to have the discussion about the legality of it within the chamber. I think all of those issues are available to be discussed on the floor. And in committee, that bill is probably going to end up in a committee. The committee will have that dis same discussion. Right. But here's another, here's another thing that I think is important to this whole discussion, is we have a certain national policy with regards to abortion. There's still a lot of people that don't agree with it in this country. There are a lot of states that would jump at the opportunity to uh, restrict abortions. And, but if nobody is talking about it in the states, we just feel like it's unconstitutional. It, constitutions can change by the will of the people. And by nine Supreme Court justices. Yeah, but more importantly, it's the people more importantly, than nine Supreme Court justices. And there are feelings all over this country regarding this. It's, it's still an issue that separates this country. And, and, and consequently, there's going to continue to be this debate. And, and for one state to lead out and maybe for other states to follow, and now to create a better or at least a narrative uh, to changing the Constitution, you know, I, I think that's a fair process with regards to this and other issues. It's an ongoing debate based upon the Supreme Court decision that took the right away from the states to control the issue of abortion and decided that under the Constitution, women have rights to make decisions. And that's the essence, really, of Roe v. Wade. But the other side of that argument, you know, to be clear, is there's a life at yeah. stake. There's life that's being uh, taken and, and not given an opportunity. And we've got to take that very seriously. And that issue wasn't decided in the courts. In fact, it was left moot.
for the discussion to go yeah, on. Yeah, which, there you so go. They, they fed the issue. They, by not making a definition on life, it really came down to where we're at right now. Yeah. But Within the dominant here. culture of the state of Utah, there's also a concept of agency and a woman's right to choose. So, not to debate that here with you, but um, there are plenty that would point that out, not just the idea of preserving life, but the other side of the coin, which is uh, the agency involved of, the, of a woman's autonomy. And I think that's the core of this whole debate over uh, the, the woman's right to choose and, and the right of a life to have opportunity. I, as a young father, watched an ultrasound of my daughter. It, uh, very, it was, I think it was probably within the first two months. And I watched her leaping inside the womb of my wife. And then, about two or three years later, I saw her jumping on the playground. It was the same kind of a jump. Sarah was Sarah at at least two months old, or two months in gestation. And to think about that life, not having the opportunities that she's had, it's, it's a very troublesome thing for me and a lot of my constituents. You can see how emotional it is, the debate. I think we need to go to caucus, so thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.